I don't see what the point of locking my ETH is for a year to get a 5% yield. I mean, a 5% is a bit off a spread in a day in ETH. I just don't get it. And I've never been a yield guy. I've always been the macro guy. I understand a lot of people like staking and I, I have nothing against staking. I just don't care for yield. I'm a price drive guy. I'm a macro guy and I'm not driven like that. So I don't sell options. I don't buy stuff for yield or in macro land. I don't buy stuff for carry. It's just not my gig. My gig is price up, price down. And that's the risk I'm happy to run because it's a quantifiable, idiot proof risk. You know the risk you have. And then you've got the esoteric risk of what exchange, my custody in crypto. You don't even need to have that. I think the dollar's top for now. Um, I do not think the dollar bull market, structural bull market is over. I think the dollar milkshake theory is alive and well. This tipping point where growth is falling, starting to fall and inflation is coming off and rates, the rate of change of rates comes down. I think being able to distribute monetary policy in a more fair, targeted manner that helps some people and penalizes others is probably net an advantage than the broad one size fits all monetary policy. And I think that is one of the things that CBDCs can do. Will it do it this cycle? No. Will it do it next cycle? Probably not. The cycle after that? Probably. Okay, here's a good question. Can't break 90. Can you explain Mark Hoda's criticism against Real Vision at this time? So I would consider Mark a friend. Um, and Mark knows my my phone number and messages and has messaged me privately, but publicly he said he asked me on Twitter to get him and Sam Bankman free together for an interview. I explained to Mark, I don't know Sam. Um, I've interviewed him twice on Real Vision. And I've had one call, other call with him in my life, and that was in January 2021. So I'm like, I, I can't get hold of him. So it's not really in my wheelhouse. And I don't think I'm in a position to be able to, therefore, bring him on the platform for you to debate him. And I respect Mark. You know, Mark is very good at what he does. And I said to Mark, listen, I also think this Alameda thing stinks, but I can't help you. But for some reason... He's blaming me for something I couldn't do. I couldn't help him with. Very simply, the US is the world's reserve currency. It controls SWIFT. It controls the euro dollar market. That is how the entire world works. It's 87% of every transaction on earth is in US dollars. So I think they kind of like the system as it is. And India and China don't want the reliance on these rails. And we've seen Iran, we've seen Russia being shut out of swift rails, and that's a geopolitical risk. So they want to move faster. They also have issues with broad populations of unbanked and poor people who need to be brought into the system. And central bank digital currencies and India's whole digital initiative has helped that at scale. So I think it's a net, net good thing. Dominance of Bitcoin. Where do you see it by the end of 2023? Bitcoin dominance, by definition, will go down as new protocols come and um, the space matures. Bitcoin dominance is very high when the space is immature. As we go through um, longer periods of time with more network adoption, Bitcoin dominance goes down over time. Um, you know, if the question is, is how does Bitcoin do versus ETH? That's a different question. I think ETH outperforms because there's more network effects from ETH because there's more people building on top of the protocol and a um, higher throughput and higher number of people using it on an active daily basis. Um, and so over time, I think that outperforms. Does that mean that Ethereum wins all? No, other things will do well too. All about network adoption models 